Every year, starting in late August to early September, monsters begin popping up all over the world. Monsters, that is, in the form of latex masks. From your big box stores such as Walmart and Target, to specialty stores like Halloween Express and the much venerated Spirit Halloween, you can be sure that as the season of spooks draws closer, latex monster masks won't be far behind. But how did these diabolical devices of deception and disguise first come to be? Well, you probably won't be too surprised to hear that latex, the chief component in rubber, has been around for a long time. In our modern world, we use it to make everything from children's toys to car tires. But its use actually dates back to over 3,000 years ago when the Aztecs, Olmecs, and Mayans began harvesting the sticky liquid from rubber trees, using it to make a variety of things from the soles of their sandals to the balls used in their ceremonial sporting events, where the losers were often sacrificed to the gods. As a matter of fact, these ancient cultures even developed formulas for mixing latex with various other additives to create different grades of rubber with varying properties. But it would take thousands of years before someone decided to use it to make a mask, and that person is a gentleman by the name of Don Post. In 1938, right here in the good old US of A, Don Post founded his company, Don Post Studios, and became the first producer of latex masks. While his early masks were quite generic and featured the likes of animals, clowns, and other funny characters, it was when he made the business decision to pursue licensing deals with Hollywood that really changed the face of the mask industry forever. Don Post and his crew of talented artists began producing masks of all the classic Universal Studios movie monsters, such as Frankenstein, the Wolfman, and the Mummy. For the first time ever, people could don a mask and instantly be transformed into their favorite monster. These masks became an instant hit, and Don Post quickly became known as the Godfather of Halloween. Over the next several decades, Don Post Studios would go on to create some of the most iconic masks ever, including masks from The Planet of the Apes, Star Wars, and Star Trek. It was even a Don Post mask featured in the original low-budget cult classic movie Halloween. Yes, that's right, Michael Myers started his life as a modified Star Trek Captain Kirk mask and probably wouldn't exist if it weren't for Don Post. Sadly, Don passed away in late 1979, but his legacy will live on forever. His original masks have become serious collector's items, fetching huge prices, and his work has inspired countless artists to pursue the art, even helping give rise to modern mask-making powerhouses such as Trick or Treat Studios and the legendary Distortions Unlimited. Now, luckily, you don't have to have a huge manufacturing facility and an army of artists to make latex masks. As a matter of fact, the process is fairly simple and can be done right in your own garage with just a few hundred dollars, some time, patience, and a little imagination. So join me as I explain how to turn this into something like this. But keep in mind, this is just a brief overview, and with everything, the devil is in the details. So if you really want to learn how to make masks, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel where I'll be posting tutorials designed to teach you all the tips, tricks, and techniques you need to know to make your nightmares become a reality. And don't forget to jump on Facebook and look up Uncle Monsters Decoffinated Designs where you can get sneak peeks, behind the scenes, the latest news, and one-on-one -on -one advice and guidance. Now, let's get this show started and see from start to finish how a latex mask is made. When people find out that I make masks, the first question everyone asks is, how did you ever get into doing that? And the answer to that is a very long story, too long for this video. But the second question I seem to get asked is, so how do you make a latex mask anyways? Well, 
this is basically where it all starts. Every latex mask begins its life as nothing more than a bunch of clay. In order to turn this clay into a wearable mask, you'll first have to figure out what it is that you want to make. Then there's a whole bunch of pre-planning to be done, such as how will the wearer see, how big to make it, how many copies do I plan to make, and how will it be molded. These are all things you want to take into consideration well before you begin. I will be making a video that talks about pre-planning, so be sure to keep an eye out for it. But in the meantime, let's just keep moving along. So once you know what it is that you want to make, it's time to create a three-dimensional version of your vision. This is typically done by building the clay up on what's called an armature, such as this. An armature serves as your supporting body for your work, giving you something to build upon, and it helps you to determine where the wearer's eyes, nose, and mouth will be. It's kind of critical if you want it to actually fit over someone's face and have them be able to see. In a best case scenario, you want to start with a really good armature. Ideally, you want to start with something specifically designed for the purpose, as they often have features built in to help ensure your mask will be a success. Again, I will be making a video that covers all the types of armatures available and some of their pros and cons, so keep an eye out for that in the future as well. If your budget won't allow for a purpose-built armature, you can get by with a good mannequin bust, which is what this sculpt is actually built on. The problem with the mannequin is they're often slightly smaller than the average head, and because latex shrinks when it cures, you have to keep that in mind. You'll need to build the clay up to an appropriate thickness and make sure that the features are positioned correctly so the mask will fit properly. This will add a bit of difficulty, but as long as you're aware of it, you can work around it. Alternatively, I've seen a lot of people resort to using styrofoam head forms, such as this, the kind made for holding wigs. This really is the worst way to go. Sure, it'll work, sort of, but as you can see, they are ridiculously small, even smaller than a mannequin head, and that compounds the difficulty of getting everything the right size. I really cannot stress enough, this is not the way you want to go. Now, once you have your armature, you're going to need to get some clay and some sculpting tools, and you're ready to begin. Of course, there are several types of clays to choose from, and some that you want to stay away from. In addition, there are major differences in the quality of sculpting tools, and I will cover those in future videos. But for now, let's keep it moving along. Everything is all about steps, and sculpting is no different. The first step in sculpting is simply blocking out your major forms. Accuracy isn't so important right now, because all we're trying to do is get the overall shapes in roughly the right place. Now, it is important to remember, this is a creative process, and it takes time and practice. So don't rush yourself. Every sculpt I make goes through what I like to call the ugly phase. This is where you begin to doubt your ability to make something even close to what you're after. But trust me, take your time, don't rush it, and just keep working at it until you begin to see what you're after. If you really find yourself stuck, Facebook has some really great groups with a lot of tremendous artists. Latex Mask Central, Sculptors, Mask Makers, and Makeup Artists, and of course, Uncle Monsters, Mask Fanatics all make great resources. Join them, post some pics, and ask for suggestions. Even I find myself stuck once in a while, and getting a fresh set of eyes to look at it may give you the help you need to get over that hump. Finally, once all the major forms are complete and the larger details such as wrinkles, skin folds, expression contours, and such are done, it's time to add all the fine details and textures, and then your sculpt will be complete. Of course, you want to be really sure that every last little detail is just right. You see, your finished mask is going to look exactly like your sculpt because during the next phase, you're going to be setting those details in stone. Literally. Once your sculpt is complete, it's time to make your mold. Molds are typically made in two parts, usually a front and a back. But occasionally, depending on the sculpt, three or more parts may be required. To make a multi-part mold, the original sculpt is divided into smaller parts by adding a dividing wall where you want the mold seam to be. Alignment keys are then added so that the two parts of the mold will eventually fit together, and plaster is layered on the first part of the sculpt. Oftentimes, burlap or hemp fibers are added to the plaster in layers in order to strengthen the mold. Once the first half of the mold is cured, which usually takes about an hour or so, depending on the plaster you're using, the dividing wall is removed, pry points are added, and the exposed plaster is given a coat of Vaseline to prevent the two parts from bonding, and it allows you to split the mold open when it's done. 
Once the second part of the sculpt is prepped, plaster is added just like on the first side and allowed to cure. Once it's cured, it's time to carefully split the mold open using the pry points and begin the process of cleaning clay out of the mold. Many people, yours truly included, consider the molding phase to be the most critical part of mask making. This is because you'll be working with some pretty strict time constraints because the plaster kicks or begins curing within a short period of time. And once it does, there's nothing you can do but sit back and wait. Plus, when you break open the mold, more times than not, your original sculpt will be completely obliterated. A mistake during the molding phase can spell disaster for all your time and effort and may require you to completely start over at the very beginning. So it's a good idea to have all your supplies ready and within arm's reach before you start. Once you're done and your mold is all cleaned out, you will have a perfect copy of your work, only it'll be a negative image, and you'll be ready to move forward to the casting phase. Once your mold is done and cleaned out, it's time to make your first pull. Masks are made of a special type of latex, commonly referred to as mask latex, which I guess makes sense. Mask latex is a thicker type of latex than the liquid latex you commonly find at your local Halloween shops or special effects makeup stores. That latex is much thinner and it's actually designed for direct skin application and it really won't stand up well for casting a mask. Another common latex you may come across is balloon latex and trust me, that won't work either. So make sure you're getting the right stuff. Latex casting is done primarily using one of two general methods, either slip casting or dwell casting. In dwell casting, latex is poured directly into the mold until it's completely filled. Then the latex is left to sit or dwell in the mold for a period of time, usually around 30 minutes to an hour. Then it's poured back into its bucket, which leaves a thin layer of latex on the inside of the mold and that cures into the mask. Sometimes multiple dwells may be needed to build up a thicker coat. With slip casting, smaller amount of latex is used and the mold is rotated by hand, allowing the latex to flow or slip around the inside of the mold, filling all the nooks and crannies. Now, both methods have their pros and cons. Dwell casting requires that you have a lot more latex on hand, which means spending more on supplies, but it does require less attention, which frees you up to do other things. Slip casting, on the other hand, will allow you to purchase latex in smaller quantities, but it does mean you'll be spending a lot more time rotating the mask into different positions every so often to ensure an even coating. Either method works, it's just a matter of preference. Personally, I prefer the dwell method, but because I have a bad back, picking up a heavy mold and pouring out the excess latex is out of the question. Being that I'm not one to let adversity get in my way, I built this mold box, which allows me to easily pour the latex without any stress at all. Remember, work hard, not smart. Regardless of which method you choose, the way latex cures is by the same process. As the latex comes into contact with the plaster, the plaster begins absorbing the liquids and leaving behind the solids to bond and form a skin on the inside of the mold. After the excess latex is poured out and that skin is left to air dry, you will then be ready to make your pull. Now this mask was already pulled, just put in here for demonstration purposes, but this is what we call a blank. Um, when this fully cures up, we'll trim all of the seams, we'll grind all of that down, we'll cut our eye holes, and then once you do that, you are ready for paint. When it comes to painting a mask, there are several different methods you can choose from. It really depends on available materials, your budget, and of course, your personal preference. From rubber cement paint formulations, to what's called Pax paint, to acrylics mixed with latex, and even household latex paint itself. But one thing always remains a constant. Whatever paint method you choose, you have to make sure that, number one, it adheres to the latex, and number two, it remains flexible even after drying. Otherwise, the paint will crack, peel, and flake off in no time. Like everything else, painting a mask involves several steps. First, a base coat of color is applied. This will become the general color of the mask. Next, washes and shading are added to give that base coat depth. Then, using a combination of tools, including airbrushes, paintbrushes, and even markers, fine details are added. Once the paint is complete, the mask must be sealed with a clear sealant in order to protect the paint. And if desired, additional details such as hair or other accessories can be added. Finally, oftentimes, a slit is cut in the back to make putting the mask on or taking it off easier. 
This cut should end with a small round cutout to prevent the mask from tearing any further. And with all of that complete, you now have a finished mask that's ready to wear and scare the bejesus out of people. As you can see, there's a lot of steps involved in making a latex mask. And a finished mask truly is a work of art. Of course, like any piece of art, if you want it to last a long time, you need to make sure it's properly cared for. Use care when wearing it and make sure you're careful putting it on and taking it off. Latex masks can be easily torn and while most tears are repairable, it's not an easy task. Masks should also periodically be cleaned after use. This can be done by gently wiping the exterior of the mask with a damp cloth, using only water, but be sure to test an inconspicuous area first to make sure the color doesn't wipe off. As for the interior, a soft cloth dampened with a little isopropyl alcohol can be used to clean any sweat or makeup from the interior. Once cleaned, allow the mask time to air dry before storing it away. And as for storing your masks, Ideally, you should keep the mask on a stand, perhaps displayed in a collection somewhere, in a very prominent place in your home, maybe in a huge, beautiful wood and glass display case, where everyone who comes over can enjoy the collection as well. And if you're lucky enough to have a spouse or partner that's cool with that, well, good on you, my friend. Just make sure they're placed out of direct sunlight, preferably away from fluorescent lights, and dusted periodically. Latex is a natural product and does tend to rot eventually, but taking these precautions will help them survive much longer. If on the other hand, they must be packed away until the next haunt season, the best thing you can do is stuff the mask with a soft material such as pillow stuffing, scraps of fabric or old t-shirts, or even brown craft paper. This will help it hold its shape and prevent it from becoming deformed. Lastly, wrap the mask in a cloth bag or even an old t-shirt, then store it in a location where the temperature and humidity will stay fairly constant. Avoid storing masks in plastic bags or allowing masks to touch each other latex to latex. This may cause them to stick together, which will damage them when you pull them apart. Oh, and don't use styrofoam head forms to display them. I haven't seen it personally, but I've heard time and again in many circles that doing, some, doing so can hasten the rotting of the mask. I've never tested the theory myself, but I also haven't wanted to sacrifice a mask to do so. Also, avoid storing them in places like garages, attics, or storage sheds anywhere with extreme temperature and humidity fluctuations. This will cause them to fall apart in no time. Instead, opt for keeping them in a closet or under your bed. After all, isn't that where monsters belong? Now, a quality mask properly cared for, you can easily expect to get many, many years of use from. So there you have it, all wrapped up in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please give it a like and a share. My goal is to help as many people enjoy this art as much as I do, and sharing is caring. Now, before we go, I have a couple of viewer questions I'd like to share. So, our first question comes from Melody in Syracuse, New York, and she writes, Dear Uncle Monster, I'm a MUA makeup artist, and I want to do foam latex appliances. Is this similar to doing that? Well, Melody, thank you for the question, and yes, it is similar, but there are a few differences. You're going to want to sculpt on a life cast of the person who's going to be wearing the appliance. The materials are different as far as the latex is concerned, and casting is different. However, I think this art is much less demanding than doing appliances, so it's definitely a good idea to learn how to do this and then translate those skills into the makeup end of it. And I have one here from David in Woodland, California. Hey, that's not far from me. We're practically neighbors. And David says, Dear Uncle Monster, I really want to learn how to do this, but it's really expensive. And what if I'm no good? Well, David, I say go for it. You don't have to buy everything at once. Start with some clay, some tools, and an armature. That'll get you sculpting. From there, you can invest as you go. As far as not being good at it, there is a ton of tutorials available. Aside from mine, I recommend checking out Stilt Beast Studios. Also look up Stuart Bray. Ed Edmonds of Distortions Unlimited has a series of Monster Lab videos. I guarantee between their help and me, we can make you as good as you want to be. And I am completely self-taught, never attended so much as a single class on the subject, and never sculpted anything in my life prior to trying this. So if I can do it, you can too. Alrighty, so that's all I got, my friends. Again, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you would, please like, share, comment, 
Don't forget to subscribe. And if you want, shoot me a question as a video if you can, and I'll add it to the show. My mission is to help you learn this. So like any good uncle, Uncle Monster's here for you. So until the next time, remember, I'm not always making masks, but when I do, I make sure they're fully decoffinated. Stay scary, my friends.